All right, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, as usual, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Tonight, we're going to dive into another new sutta. Uh, tonight, we're, we're still going to be looking in the Majjhima Nikaya, the middle-length discourses. Uh, tonight, we're moving on to sutta number 55, the Jivaka Sutta. Um, this is the teaching given to Jivaka. Um, before we even dive into the sutta, though, I want to kind of give you a little background on Jivaka. This is going to be a, um, tonight's kind of, I think, a sutra lover's night. Um, there's a lot of like interesting little details in this sutta, but there's also what this sutta is sort of mainly about. And just to let you know right away, this sutta is a pretty famous teaching of the Buddha because this is the, the source of information for Buddhism and meat eating. So we're going to talk about vegetarianism tonight. We're going to talk Buddhism's relationship to that. But I want you to know that that's why this sutra is sort of very famous, is because this is the sutra that deals with that topic. So we're going to get into that, but we're going to get into a lot of little layers here. I think, well, actually, let's do it this way. So I'm going to do this kind of almost line by line tonight, or at least kind of paragraph by paragraph. So let's look at the introduction really quickly. So again, this is the Jivaka Sutta, number 55. Thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was living it at Rajagaha, in the mango grove of Jivaka Kumara Bahacha. <laughs> Let's talk about Jivaka Kumara Bahacha. <laughs> so, what we kind of, we don't need to know this, by the way, but it's nice to know this. So, a little background on Jivaka. So, poor, poor little Jivaka. So, when this person was born, at least the backstory of Jivaka is that he was basically the child of what sounds like a prostitute in that way. And so the mother put the little baby in the basket and then put it in a garbage heap. <laughs> Somebody came along and saw a baby on a garbage heap and realized it's still alive. And in, in Pali, kind of uh, related to Sanskrit, the cry was, Jivakti, it's alive. And the baby was then taken and kind of given to King Bimbasara, the king of Magadha. You could basically understand that the child was given to the state in that way, <laughs> like not literally King Bimbasara. <laughs> like it was, oh, thank you. But the child was given to the, 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 the court, let's say, the court of King Bimbasara, who was the king of Magadha, right, where the Buddha was from. And then because of that cry, Jivati, <laughs> it's alive, he, he took on the name Jivaka, which basically kind of means the living one. Now, because he was raised by the court or by the prince, he's considered a youth, a Kumara of Bahacha, which I believe kind of references the prince or the king. I'm not exactly sure about that etymology. But his name or his last name, Kumara Bahacha, kind of refers to his upbringing, not as a specific child of Bimbasara, but raised by Bimbasara. Now, what happens is, is this, and this is the kind of the really interesting thing for tonight. Jivaka grows up in 
King Bimbisara's court. At a very young age, he becomes, um, well, very learned, let's say, and he actually goes and studies medicine. He comes back and becomes the official doctor for the king, Bimbisara. He also eventually becomes the doctor for the Buddha. Now, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to that in a moment, but what happens is, and this is a little bit of Buddhist history or even, even just Indian history that you kind of need to know, or it's nice to know this if you're studying Buddhism. So Magadha, where the Buddha was from in kind of northeastern India, well, the main king at, when the Buddha became enlightened was Bimbisara. But then something happened. King Bimbisara's son, Ajatashatru, the prince, well, he did something not very good. Different, there's different stories about this. In one story, the prince, Ajatashatru, murders his father. In another version of the story, the prince just locks his father in basically prison until he kind of dies. And then Ajatashatru becomes king of Magadha. Now, I'm telling you this because in preparing for tonight's uh, sutta, I discovered something and I was really excited about this and I'm happy to share it. So, as you know, we're reading from the middle length discourses, but in the long discourses of the Buddha, right, the, the kind of the, the Buddha's greatest hits, in the long discourses of the Buddha, what I think is probably the most important of the early Buddhist suttas is number two of the Diga Nikaya, and this is called the Samanapala Sutta, the fruits of the homeless life. It's one of the most, again, the most important of the early Buddhist uh, suttas. But what's interesting about it is, is this. Let me give you a little background on this sutta. So this sutta is actually about King Ajatashatru after having uh, done away with his father. And King Ajatashatru is guilty. He can't sleep. He can't eat. He feels bad. And he wants alleviation. He wants somebody to alleviate him of this karmic debt. And so he calls together all of his sort of ministers. And at the beginning of this, he's like, who, who can I go see? <laughs> who can I go see to help me with this? And so one minister says, ooh, you could, you could go see so-and-so. And then it's like, well, what does he teach? Mm, I don't want to talk to that guy. <laughs> what about this guy? You could go see that guy. No, nah, I don't want to go see that guy. Now, eventually what happens is that, and this is what I didn't know. It says at that time, Jivaka Kumarabacha, the doctor. He was the one who says, Hey, King, I hear there's this Buddha guy, Gotama. You could go see him. And so the king, Ajatashatru, says, You know, you're right. And they all go see the Buddha. Now, it's a funny story. Because basically the Buddha says, oh, yeah, I, I know how to alleviate your suffering. I know how to alleviate your karmic debt. And basically walks him through the whole Buddhist process and ultimately is saying, yeah, just renounce. Just renounce. <laughs> Come and join us. Wear robes and meditate. You, you will love it. <laughs> and the king basically says, you know, that sounds really amazing but I'm busy, I've got work to do. And so the king leaves. But all the while, 
Jivaka Kumara Bacha is there. Now I'm telling you this because at this time, during the sutta I was just talking about, Jivaka is not a Buddhist. He's just a do. He's a doctor. And not unlike today, he was a well-paid doctor, meaning he was a very wealthy person from being the king of, or the doctor of the king, doctor of all of these very famous wealthy people in Magadha. So I'm telling you that little bit of the backstory because this mango grove, well, this is called the Jivaka Rama Vihara, the J Jivaka's Mango Grove or Jivaka's Vihara. So this is just one of Jivaka's many properties. And he kind of gifted a mango grove to the Buddha and his followers. By the way, like many of these places, in India, you can go, in Bihar, you can go to Raj, or the remnants of Rajgriha, and you can see the uh, kind of the, the footprint of where the Jivaka Rama Vihara used to be. So just a little anecdote there. All right. So I'm telling you all of this big backstory of Jivaka because his role as a doctor is going to be kind of significant in this one. And as far as I can tell, the sutta that we're about to go deeper into is the Jivaka's conversion story. So this is where, at least the, the way that this sutta ends is with Jivaka saying, sign me up as, as a lay follower, but sign me up. So let's see what's on Jivaka's mind. So at the mango grove, at that time, then Jivaka Kumara Bacha went to the Blessed One. And after paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, I've heard this out, out and about. They slaughter living beings for the recluse Gotama. The recluse Gotama knowingly eats meat prepared for him from animals killed for his sake. Venerable sir, do those who speak thus say what has been said by the Blessed One? And do they not misrepresent him with what is contrary to fact? Do they explain in accordance with the Dharma in such a way that nothing which provides a ground for censure can be legitimately deduced from their assertions? The Buddha replies, Jivaka, those who speak thus do not say what has been said by me, but they misre misrepresent me with what is untrue and contrary to fact. All right, so, so much for what Jivaka has heard, right? Jivaka, I say that there are three instances in which meat should not be eaten. When it is seen, heard, or suspected, that the living being has been slaughtered for oneself. I say that meat should not be eaten in these three instances. I say that there are three instances in which meat may be eaten, when it is not seen, not heard, nor even suspected that the living being has been slaughtered for oneself. I say that meat may be eaten in these three instances. All right. So that's kind of part one of the sutta. There's kind of these movements in the sutta. So let's deal with that one. So the first thing we kind of want to acknowledge about this sutta is that, of course, 
this is a Pali Sutta. So it's coming to us from that kind of Taheravada tradition of the elders, the kind of more austere, certainly monastic path. So I want to first make it clear, and this is going to be important for the rest of the sutta. I want to make it clear that this sutta, the Buddha is talking to the monastics, like the people who have renounced in that way, or he's talking about people who have renounced. And what I'm getting at is so much of this sutta, we need to keep in mind that the life of a Buddhist monk at this time and nuns that it was a big part of it was about begging for your daily meal. The early Buddhist tradition is really, really like focused on this. And I'm talking about how like early schisms in the, in the Buddhist tradition, they split off because some groups were, were storing salt and that was considered like a no-no because you were supposed to beg new every day for everything. So I just want to point out that this is like a very serious aspect of begging for food. And now the question is, is, well, let me rephrase Jivaka's question. He says, I've heard that they kill animals for you. And that you allow your, you know, your followers to eat meat. And the Buddha says, no, I only allow it in these three circumstances, right? Where it hasn't been seen, heard, or suspected that it's been killed for you. Now, if you didn't pick up on kind of what they're implying, the idea in the, in the early Buddhist tradition was that the Buddhist monastics, the monks and the nuns, survived on leftovers like that's kind of a really important part of this is that the general idea was that the the monk was supposed to just get what was remaining left over and so at that level the idea was is that if somebody had slaughtered an animal and a whole family or a whole community had eaten of the animal and then there was leftovers well it would be a great shame for that to go to waste if, you know, the animal has given its life. And so, so as not to waste all of that, it was okay to give that to the Buddhist monks. <laughs> yeah, kind of in that way. The freegan in that way, as a commenter puts, like, yeah, that that's the idea. But I think in, in order to really like get at the heart of this sutta tonight, I think we're going to have to understand that the, uh, the basic disposition of the monastic, it was about, I will be satisfied with whatever goes in this bowl. And I shouldn't have any preferences for what's put in it. I should be grateful for whatever has been put in it. So, I want us to notice that the focus is on a life of begging for food and the dynamics involved in that. And what I'm what I'm getting at is, is that in order for us to extrapolate this sutra to the 21st century for a bunch of householders, like I want us to be dynamic or flexible in that. So okay. Um one thing I want to point out too, just about this one part, the idea of seeing, hearing, or suspecting that an animal has been killed for you. Like, so again, if you're a nun or you're a monk, what we want to be aware of, and this is, again, this is going to be part of the whole sutta as we get towards the end of it. We need to keep in mind that in India, at the time when this is taking place, on the giving end, so on, on the end of the people who are giving the food to the monastics, the idea is, is that there is a, a karmic exchange going on. And the idea here is, is I'm going to give you some food 
but in in as a consequence of me doing that you're giving me good punya you're giving me good merit in return now when the sutta talks about suspecting somebody might have slaughtered an animal for you it's because somebody might try to trick you if you were a monk and they would be like oh no 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 well we we didn't kill this for you no we didn't go ahead eat it eat it <laughs> because they want the they want the punya they want the merit so there was a little game going on there apparently and so the buddha was saying no no if you see them if you he hear that that happened, or if you even have a funny suspicion that it was killed for you, you shouldn't eat it. Otherwise, though, the meat eating is allowed. It's permissible. So I know that for mm, probably not anybody here tonight, because I know that you all are well studied in that way, but the idea is, is that for some people that might be a surprise because Buddhism and vegetarianism is so kind of closely associated. So I wanted, before we kind of go to the next section of the sutta, I want to say something about that really quickly, like Buddhism's relationship to vegetarianism. So the reason why there is such a close association between Buddhism and vegetarianism is because in East Asia, so we're talking China, Korea, Mongolia, Japan, Vietnam. So in East Asia, that of course is all, they're all practicing Mahayana Buddhism, not Theravada Buddhism, not the kind of old school monastic style, but the kind of the more advanced Mahayana style. Now, as you know, the Mahayana Buddhist tradition is based upon the Bodhisattva path, not the path of the Shravaka, the, vo the voice hearer, the monks and the nuns. It's the path of the Bodhisattva. The path of the Bodhisattva is a different path than the path of a recluse or a monastic. And if you haven't heard this recently, the main huge difference between those two types of Buddhism is that the Theravada Buddhism is considered the path of individual liberation. It is a method and a technique for you, the individual, to clear up your mind and become awakened in some sense. The Bodhisattva path is not the path of just individual liberation. It's the path of universal liberation what they call the liberation of all sentient beings. That's a slightly, if not majorly different path. So what I'm getting at is, is that notice that in the early tradition, which is focused on the individual, if I eat meat or I don't eat meat, that's going to depend upon where I got it from. It's in the bodhisattva path, though, that bodhisattvas or practitioners who are on the bodhisattva path, they will take what are called the 48 bodhisattva vows. This is a major part of East Asian Buddhism. They don't really have the bodhisattva vows in Southeast Asia where the Theravada tradition survives. But if you're a Buddhist, in East Asia, at some point, you've probably taken the 48 bodhisattva vows. Number two of those 48 vows is to not eat meat. It's basically a, a, a vow or a, a precept about vegetarianism. So I want everybody to know that that's where the rule the rule comes from the bodhisattva vows. In the original vinya, in the original monastic path, as the Buddha just said, meat eating was permissible provided it satisfied those categories. But I want to say, oh, please, Noe. 
I have a lot more to say about the Bodhisattva vows, but I'd love to hear questions. Yeah? So I want to say one thing really quickly, and this is not... I just want to let everybody know this, though. <laughs> so... I, I know if I if you heard me and you're like, oh, the Bodhisattva path, path of universal liberation, no wonder they're interested in the animals. No wonder they're interested in not eating meat at all. But I want you to know something, though. The third of the Bodhisattva vows is to not eat leeks. And I say that not to... <laughs> not just to say anything, but I do want you to understand that the bodhisattva vows are tricky that way. In that, you know, part of them, actually, number three, by the way, if you're interested, is actually that there are the five pungent herbs, uh, garlic, leeks, scallions, and a couple of others that bodhisattvas or Mahayana Buddhists are not supposed to eat. Now, what they say is that it makes your breath stink, and so you shouldn't chant with stinky breath. That's what I heard. But again, I don't want to belittle the rule about eating, uh, of being vegetarian, but I just kind of want to put it in context, though, in that way, that it's right next to a kind of rather Taoist rule about the pungent herbs. So take that for what it's worth. <laughs> um, question, Noe, or I did any questions, ideas about the vegetarianism question and where it comes from? No, no, I just, I was just trying to, that was great. Thank you. I, I just don't remember the verbiage of the second precept off the top of my head. Mm. So if you could, do you recall what it exactly said? I don't. I had it up earlier. <laughs> That's okay. I won't I'll go look. looking for it now, but. Yeah, thank you. I'll look it up myself because I suppose I could. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. But I, I appreciate the, the that the next one is don't eat leeks. You <laughs> could eat Italian. What? <laughs> okay. Oh, and by the way, just just to be complete in uh, on that, the 48 bodhisattva vows come from a whole other sutra, a, a Mahayana kind of Sanskrit-based sutra called the Brahmajala Sutra, the Brahma's net. So just so that you know. Um, all right. Yeah, let's get back to the sutta. But if anything comes up about the vegetarian thing, please just ask. Otherwise, now let's get to the next part. So the Buddha clarifies when meeting, meat eating is permissible and when it's not. But then he mentions this. And by the way, this is all still part of his kind of answer to Jivaka. Like he's about to explain or he's about to describe the life of a recluse. So he says, here Jivaka, some bhikkhu, a monk, lives in dependence upon a certain village or a certain town. He abides pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with loving kindness. Likewise, the second, Likewise the third, likewise the fourth direction, and so above, and so below, all around, and everywhere, and to all as himself, he abides pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. Then a householder or a householder's son comes to him and invites him for the next day's meal. The bhikkhu accepts, if he wants to. <laughs> when the night is ended, in the morning he dresses and taking his bowl and his outer robe, 
goes to the house of that householder or that householder's son and sits down on a seat made ready. Then the householder or the householder's son serves him with good alms food. He does not think, how good that the householder or the householder's son serves me with good alms food. If only a householder or a householder's son might serve me with such good alms food in the future. He does not think thus. He eats that alms food without being tied to it, without being infatuated with it, without being utterly committed to it, seeing the danger in it and understanding the escape from it. What do you think, Jivaka? Would that bhikkhu on such an occasion choose for his own affliction or for another's affliction or for the affliction of both of them? No, venerable sir, Jivaka said. Does not that bhikkhu sustain himself with blameless food on that occasion? Yes, venerable sir. I have heard this, venerable sir. Brahma abides in loving kindness. Venerable sir, the blessed one is my visible witness to that. For the blessed one abides in loving kindness. Jivaka, any lust, any hate, any delusion whereby ill will might arise, has been abandoned by the Tathagata, cut off at the root, made like a palm stump, done away with so that they are no longer subject to future arising. Now, if what you said before referred to that, then I allow it to you. Venerable sir, what I said ref referred to precisely that. All right, let's walk through that. So I think there's a, you know, like all suttas, there's a lot of different ways to read this. So like all Dharma doors, I'm just sharing the way that I read this. But in that little description, the way that I read it is, is that the life of a recluse, the life of a bhikkhu, is to sit around spreading loving kindness in all directions abundantly to everyone. And then <laughs> doing that, somebody's going to come up and offer you a meal. <laughs> and if you would like to accept it, do. And then the next day, they go and they have the food. And then what the Buddha describes is the mentality that the recluse, that the practitioner, should have towards the food. And it shouldn't be this getting all excited if it's really good food. There's other suttas, by the way, that talk about not getting all depressed if it's like kind of not your favorite food in that way, but just being thankful for the food in that sense. And then this idea of, or the problem that you might start hoping, ooh, I hope I get this tomorrow. I hope I get this again. And now the mind is in the future. The mind is not present in that way. So the Buddha is describing this whole kind of, um, it's not just about a lifestyle of renunciation and begging and all of that. What I want us to notice is, is that the Buddha has launched into basically a teaching of what are called the four Brahma Viharas, right? We've only, we only did the first one, loving kindness. He's going to do the other three, by the way. But I just want you to kind of acknowledge or recognize that this sutra is emphasizing that the practitioner of Buddhism is practices loving kindness in order to avoid ill will, hatred in these things. And all of this is actually tied to the violence involved in slaughtering animals. So I kind of want you to recognize that there's this kind of subtle conversation going on around the violence involved in slaughtering animals and this utterly peaceful lifestyle of 
the recluses in that way. Also, a quick word on the Brahma Viharas. So one of the things that I want to mention is that I know that the four, they're also called the four immeasurable states of mind, right? So these are the extending of loving kindness in all directions, including upward and downward. And it's about basically kind of enveloping the world in a sphere of metta, loving kindness. Now, the next one is going to be about enveloping the world in a sphere of karunya, compassion. And then the third is about enveloping the world in a sphere of mudita, what is usually translated as like empathic joy, being stoked for everybody, being happy for everybody. And then the fourth is extending and enveloping the world in a sphere of equanimity. Those are the four immeasurable states of mind. And what I kind of wanted to mention really quickly about them is these are often a practice that you find in the bodhisattva path, that you find in the Mahayana tradition, because the Mahayana tradition is about that universal liberation. It's about liberating all sentient beings. Well, what I kind of would like you to know, like from a maybe, maybe a historical point of view, is that this practice, which was a part of the early Buddhist tradition, which was about being kind and compassionate towards all beings, it seems that this early practice gets kind of, it becomes an interest of the Mahayana. Let's put it that way. And the Mahayana kind of says, that's a really, really important practice. Whoop. And it becomes almost a cornerstone of the bodhisattva meditation practice. But I want you to know that it comes from the early tradition in that way. I also want to recognize one idea, and it's where Jivaka, he affirms, oh yeah, Brahma abides in loving kindness. And as we move forward, he will also say, oh yeah, Brahma abides in compassion. Brahma abides in empathic joy and Brahma abides in equanimity. So really quickly, and I don't want to get into this too much, but it's just sort of part of the larger theme of the sutta. We kind of would like to remember that in the world of Buddhism, there's these three dimensions of reality called the realm of desire, the realm of form, and the formless realm. And I want to remind you that the realm of desire, that's the realm of the afflictions and greed, anger, desire, psychodramas, um, anxiety, like all of that. The realm of form is a very neutral realm of the elements, basically. Earth, water, fire, and air. And that's because Brahma, God, or at least the creator God, Brahma works with the four elements and makes the world. And then humans come and project their psychodramas on top of Brahma's creation. But what I want us to acknowledge or know about is that Brahma, Brahma is like, is love, is like mother nature in that way of like, Brahma's compassionate. Brahma is like, if there's joy going on in the world, that's Brahma. In other words, like Brahma is this nurturer is compassionate, is kind. So, you know, 
I, I, in other words, there's another God, Shiva, or actually there's a few gods, but Shiva, Indra, they're temperamental. M meaning you can, you can get on Indra's bad side and that's not great. But Brahma, Brahma loves you. <laughs> like that's the idea. I'm telling you that because the idea is, is that a meditator who transcends the realm of desire puts all of their psychodramas down for a moment and who ascends to the realm of just pure form, you're in Brahma's realm now. And so that is this sort of what is called the Brahma Vihara. Now, I want to remind you that the sutta that we're reading takes place in the Jivaka Rama Vihara. That's the mango grove. I'm just saying this to point out that Buddhists use the same word to describe a monastery here on earth, as well as a meditative state in the heaven of Brahma. They are both Viharas. It's just a question of which Vihara are you in in that way. Okay. Oh, one other thing. Oh, yeah, no, please. Um, I'm curious uh, with the the connection between violence or nonviolence and 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 eating animals. If the if it really is limited to the question of slaughtering or also the you know whatever other violence uh, animals who are kept in captivity are subject to. Yep, it is. Um... Amazing question, Noam, because it will be answered exactly oh. by the end of the sutta. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I, I really like this sutta actually for answering the kind of question that you are interested in. So just one last thing to quickly add about the Brahma Viharas. A moment ago, I mentioned that the four immeasurable states of mind, these four meditative states have always been a part of Buddhism. In fact, if you study your Dharma, if you study your early sutras, the Buddha even says, yeah, I actually, I learned this before I was the Buddha. Meaning the four Brahma Viharas are a pre-existent uh, practice. Now, I mentioned a moment ago that that old practice becomes like a cornerstone of the Bodhisattva Mahayana meditative practice. Well, the other thing that I want to point out is the specific language that's involved in this, and, and it's a trope, meaning it's a, it's a stock phrase. This idea of um, all four quarters above and below, extending loving kindness, and then the language of... Um, the all-encompassing, or so, the practitioner abides pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. So the specific language I want to focus on is the language of immeasurable. So I've, I've already said it several times already. These are called the four immeasurable states of mind. I just want to point out that that language of immeasurable, if you've studied with me at all, or you've studied sutras, you might think that kind of sounds like that Mahayana Buddhist language, where they're always talking about like, boundless, inconceivable, um, you know, these really hyperbolic ideas in the Mahayana tradition, this immeasurableness of the, of the Brahma Viharas, this sounds a little Mahayana-ish. It should sound a little Mahayana-ish. And what I kind of want to just put a spotlight on, it's the idea that if I were to go to the go to a forest, an, an aranya, and I were to just go like and just go in and go deep 
in my kind of in my mind, in myself in that way. That is a practice. And there's a way in which that is very, let's say, measurable. Hmm. And what I mean by that is it's one person. <laughs> it's one person. But when the practitioner turns their heart outward to all sentient beings, you are now in immeasurable land. You are affecting immeasurable numbers of sentient beings. And there's something in the Mahayana tradition where they're kind of excited about that idea of the boundlessness of such compassion. And the idea here is we needn't, we needn't treat compassion as if it's a finite commodity that I only have like a certain amount of. And so I can only give it to my family and close friends. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you know, it's, it's limited supply. No, <laughs> infinite, infinite, ab abundant, inexhaustible amounts of compassion, actually. <laughs> so just wanted to mention that because I'm always trying to plug Mahayana Buddhism. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's continue, because I want to definitely get to the end to answer Noam's question. <clears throat> so the format that we just walked through is then repeated. The Buddha tells Jivaka, hear Jivaka. A bhikkhu lives in dependence upon a certain village or a certain town, and he abides pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with compassion, or then the next one with a mind imbued with alt altruistic joy or empathic joy. And then the fourth one pervading everywhere with or imbued with equanimity. Likewise, the second direction, third direction, fourth direction, above and below, around and everywhere. And to all as oneself. The practitioner abides pervading the all encompassing world with a mind imbued with equanimity, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. And then a householder or a householder's son comes and asks and invites you for the next day's meal. The bhikkhu accepts if they want to. And the whole thing gets repeated regarding the thoughts about not, you know, getting this in the future and all of that. And then the Buddha says, what do you think, Jivaka? Would that bhikkhu on such an occasion choose for his own affliction or for another's affliction or for the affliction of both? And Jivaka says, no world or no venerable sir. Does not that bhikkhu sustain himself with blameless flute on that occasion? Yes, venerable sir. By the way, I forgot to mention it when we did it the first time. So the Buddha, the Buddha says this thing regarding a practitioner who practices the loving kindness, gets invited over for a meal, accepts the meal, but doesn't wanted in the future necessarily, isn't attached to it. The Buddha says this thing about, would that bhikkhu on such an occasion choose for his own affliction or for another's affliction or for the affliction of both? And Jivaka says, no. Well, if you weren't here last week, the sutta that we did last week, which was the Potalia Sutta, another householder, it went through the same language and it actually went into more detail. I think it was last week's sutta that did this, but it talks about that, that sutta from last week. It talks about how 
if somebody isn't violent, for example, well, actually what it says is that if somebody is violent, then they themselves suffer or others might suffer or both might suffer. But if one, if somebody, if I am not angry, I don't suffer. Others don't suffer. Neither of us suffers. It's a win-win. So the whole sutta last week was about win-win situations. I don't suffer. You don't suffer. But if I were to like lie to you, I might suffer by feeling guilty about that. You might suffer because you might act on my lie or we both might suffer. But if I'm honest with you, I won't have any guilt or blame. I won't feel bad about being honest. It won't affect you in that way if I'm honest. So it's a win-win. So that's what's being referred to there in terms of if a practitioner takes a meal the way described, and in particular, of course, we're talking about an animal not being slaughtered for their sake, then the monk doesn't suffer any karmic hit at all. So they're not suffering. The animal's not suffering. The people aren't suffering. It's a win, win, win in that way. So that's what the Buddha was saying to Jivaka. Isn't it a win, win this way? And Jivaka was like, yeah, it's a win, win that way. All right. <laughs> Question, comment, answered idea. Okay. So, ah. So after this um, dealing with the four Brahma Viharas and kind of all of that, we move to the next part of the sutta, sort of the end of the sutta. Um, oh, and there's also, we don't need to go through it exactly, but there's also the refrain the part that keeps coming up, where the Buddha says to Jivaka, Jivaka, any greed, anger, and delusion, the three poisons, so any greed, anger, or delusion whereby cruelty or discontent or aversion might arise has been abandoned by the Tathagata, by a Buddha, cut off at the root, made like a palm stump, done away with so that they no longer are subject to future arising. So I just want to remind everybody that in this sort of type of Buddhism, what makes a Buddha a Buddha? Well, the afflictions, like something like anger, just no longer arise. Whereas for some of us, we might be <laughs> currently angry, <laughs> so that's not being a Buddha, or we might not presently be angry, but we definitely have the potential for the arising of anger. But through practice, there can reach a point where there is just no more arising of greed, anger, and delusion. And if those have been totally put to rest, that's called nirvana, that's called a buddha, at least in the early tradition. So that's what's being referenced there. And now let's get to Noam's question. So Noam had this kind of, you know, question about the kind of larger, or what I heard from you, Noam, was sort of a question about the larger culture around this. So like the storing of animals, like there's a lot of other things than just the specific slaughtering of them. Yeah, is that part of your question, Noam? So you will find this very interesting then. So the last part of the sutta, the Buddha says this. If anyone slaughters a living being for the Tathagata or for his disciples, they lay up much apunya, much demerit in five instances. So whoever it is that's doing the slaughtering in that way, when he says, go and fetch that living animal. 
This is the first instance in which he lays up a punya, demerit. When that living being experiences pain and grief on being led along with a neck halter, this is the second instance in which he lays up much demerit. When he says, go and slaughter that living being, this is the third instance in which he lays up much demerit. When that living being experiences pain and grief on being slaughtered, this is the fourth instance in which he lays up much demerit. And when he provides the Tathagata or his disciples with food that is not permissible, this is the fifth instance in which he lays up much demerit. Anyone who slaughters a living being for the Tathagata or his disciples lays up much demerit in these five instances. All right. So let's break down, let's break that down. So of course, the first thing we need to discuss or address is this idea of punya and apunya, merit and no merit or demerit as it's being called. So uh, this, is a, this is a tricky a tricky one to talk about. And it's tricky for a few different reasons. The first reason is, is because we don't really have an English Western equivalent to this idea of merit and demerit. We kind of do, but we don't exactly. And I say that because in the kind of Western religious traditions, the idea is that God is like the big um, teetotaler or whatever is like keeping the score of everything in that way. And so there's a way in which an, an omniscient, all seeing God is like, I got my eye on you. I saw you do that. <laughs> Just wait till you get up to the pearly gates. Like that's sort of the, the, you know, that kind of theology. Well, so the, the idea of merit and demerit just, it's not that because the idea is in the more Indian Buddhist kind of worldview, all of this karma stuff that we talk about, it's far more mechanistic than theistic. And what I mean by that is, is that karma and karmic retribution is, is a matter of physics. Complicated psychological physics, but there's no grand sea overseer of it. It's just part of the makeup of reality in that way. In, in other words, I'll give you a, a classic example that I give a lot. If I lie in the Buddhist tradition, it's not because there's a God that knows I lied and there's the demerit. The demerit is in me fabricating two or more realities and then kind of suffering a kind of psychosis from having to deal with all of that. The karma is immediate. Now, it might take years to manifest as neuroses, but it's immediate in that sense. There's no, um, nobody's doling out the punishment and reward in that way. So my point is, is that there's this idea of punya, merit, and demerit, like anti-punya. And what's kind of tricky, this is yet another tricky part about this, in the Buddhist tradition, and this is pretty much all throughout India, or at least from what I've seen, there's an interesting kind of, um, uh, I don't even know how to put it. It's this interesting idea that merit or demerit, that it's accumulated. And what I mean is, is like even to the point of like a numerical value, 
where it's like, oh, you slaughtered an animal. That's five negative points for you because you called the animal, because you asked for it to be killed, because you killed it, because you offered it to the Buddha. Like that's five demerit points. So early Buddhism is a little interesting that way, where they actually kind of have tabulations of merit. And we're kind of seeing that play out in this little chapter here, or the end of this chapter. So I just want to mention that that's what we're talking about is the buildup of merit or demerit. But now let's talk about these five different aspects of this. So the first of them, the first demerit or apunya, is this idea of even saying, go get me that animal. I mean, with the intention, of course, to kill it in that way. But what we're noticing, or what I notice when I read this, we're noticing a very classic Buddhist understanding of karmic activity. And what it is, is in, in the Buddhist world, you often hear what you think is what you talk about. And what you talk about is what you do. In other words, there's kind of a bubble, a bubbling up of reality. And it begins with the mind thinking like, I, I want to go, I want meat. I want to eat some meat. Hey, go get me some animals to kill. So notice it moves from a thought to speech to action. So my understanding of the first of these is the vocal karma that sets into motion the slaughtering of the animal. And what we kind of need to recognize is, had there not been that initial vocal command, there wouldn't be any slaughtering. So there's the, the command, but you could also read that as the desire to have this be done in that way. Any thoughts, ideas about the first one? Like any questions about why that would be demeritus or anything? Yeah, Noe. Uh, well, it's, uh, so, so this is a Buddhism, but it was before the Buddha. This was also a teaching. No, no, is this it, is pure Buddhism. Pure Buddhism. Okay, so this wasn't before that he inherited with the yogis and all of this. Only the four Brahma Viharas is a pre-Buddhist practice. Okay. Yeah. But this is, but this is craving. It's this, it's one of the poisons. Sure. Okay. Sure. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. <clears throat> so from from the initial call of bring me bring me an animal. The second one is that when that living being experiences pain and grief on being led along with a neck halter, this is the second instance in which they lay up much demerit. So Gnome, my understanding of that would be the cruelty of the caging, the anything that's about the harm until the slaughter <laughs> in that way. So that's what I would understand that. Yeah. And that's, of course, could be very broad in that way. That could include a lot of things. And actually, now that I'm thinking about it, now that we're kind of playing this game of uh, extrapolation, the first one, the idea of bring me an animal, if you extrapolate that, you know, that could be tricky. And what I mean is, is now we're talking about you know, if somebody is the president of uh, a meat packing company, their job is to say, bring me the animals, <laughs> bring me the animal, bring me more animals, bring me more animals. And my point is, is that even though the, the, the head of the company might not be doing the slaughtering, might not be handling the animals, whoever's calling and saying, bring me more animals to slaughter, they're getting demerit in that way. So 
The first one, again, the call. The second one is about the handling. And then the third, third aspect here is when the person says, go and slaughter that animal. That's the third instance. So the actual command to do it in that way. Pretty straightforward on that one, I, I, I presume. And then, of course, the one that we figured, which is the demerit from actually slaughtering the animal. <laughs> that's the one I think we all recognized as like, oh, yeah, that's where the demerit is. But what we've kind of been forced to think about here is the, again, the context in which slaughtering happens in that way. And then there's the fifth one, the last one, which is the serving it up to the Tathagata or his disciples in that way. Now, if, if we're playing the extrapolation game, then I would say, I, I don't know, I would just, this is my reading of it, but the fifth of those would possibly be people who are serving mm. meat at a restaurant, let's say, or whatever. And by the way, I, I, I don't think I have to say this, but I'm not putting anybody out there as far as like a finger pointing of if you eat meat or not. That's not what tonight's Dharma talk is about at all. If anything, tonight is about the complexities of this question. Not at all saying this is right this is wrong or anything like that. So when I am playing what I'm calling the extrapolating game, I don't want to make, I don't want to offend anybody who serves meat in a restaurant. Don't, don't worry. At least don't worry on my account in that way. All right. Let's talk about these five all together then. Any thoughts or questions or concerns or ideas about merit, demerit, the problem of meat, meat eating, vegetarianism. Anything come up from the sutta? Yeah, Maria. Well, just that um, I'm always so um, impressed and uh, it, it always seems to come back to intention um, around things. You know, um, sometimes I say, integrity is doing the right thing when no one's looking but i think intention goes even deeper than that that's like where no one can see you know so having your intentions in the right place and definitely such a complex thing i mean i at one point sent you an email about this question i was thinking about um in the world that we live in there's so many sort of ins and outs around this and trying to be vegetarian um, and in a sort of super busy lifestyle and just with the economy piece around it. So yeah, mm -hmm. appreciate all the thoughts about it. Thank you, Maria. Yeah, I mean, it's a this is a complicated question, and I certainly have have struggled with it in my own life and practice in that way. Have gone through a variety of relationships to it, from very staunch, strict veganism for many, many years, to a kind of a more middle path, if you will. But it's certainly something that comes up a lot. I think you're totally right, Maria, that in the Buddhist tradition, intention is everything. It really is, it's so much more so because of the, the uh, because of the emphasis, emphasis on psychology in Buddhism, that the recognizing that intention is everything at, at that point. And so, you know, I think for all of us practitioners out there, if you are a Dharma practitioner, if you're a Buddhist in that way, my feeling is, is that it, there's no clear cut and dry answer about vegetarian or not, but I think there is a very clear 
directive to be mindful. And what I when I say that it's about being mindful of as much as you can, being mindful of of again just everything involved in that way, and that mindfulness in, for me is what is the most important in that way. Like even you know to the point where if if you are if you're the type of Buddhist who eats meat that moment of recognition beforehand of recognizing no this was an a creature this was an animal and they lost its life and now i'm about to survive off of it and giving kind of thanks in a way that's intention versus just sort of you know not even thinking twice about it at all so just kind of want to put that out there that i do agree with you maria that think intention is key in all of these questions in that way. Yeah, Maria. Yeah. And I think it's, it's, you know, we can easily come back around to, you know, doing the first, pre, you know, the first precept, doing as little harm as possible, you know, and you can look at that and, terms of personal liberation, or you could bring that to um, the Bodhisattva path um, as well. So um, like that's a good guideline. And I use that one myself a lot. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you mentioned that one, Maria, because I had a note that I totally skipped and I wanted to address that. And what it was is it's this, I wanted to basically point out, because I've actually already done it a few times, I didn't even realize. I wanted to point out a little bit more of this sort of early Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism split or divide. And what I mean is this, in the early Buddhist tradition, which as I said earlier, the path of individual liberation. And so what that meant was that that early Buddhist path, it was very much hyper-focused on the individual's karma. And so what I mean is, it was about me being violent and harming creatures. And so I'm not going to do anything violent. And then the idea is, is that if that animal got killed over there, and it wasn't for me, but it mm. got killed... And it just wound up in my bowl. I haven't done anything violent. Ah, but Buddhism matures. And in the Mahayana tradition, they basically were like, let's think a little bit more about this. <laughs> Is there really no harm when I don't eat or, or when I don't kill it? And there's a recognition of, no, there's still harm going on in the world. And so the Bodhisattva is like, no, no, I need, to, I need to do this in a way where I'm not promoting violence. Not me being violent, but I need to live in a way where I'm not like perpetuating it. And so the Mahayana is actually a much more sophisticated form of Buddhism that way because it's about a type of Buddhism that is truly universal. Early Buddhism is awesome if you're a forest dwelling monastic. <laughs> but as soon as you try to take those teachings and apply them universally, it gets very complicated to actually apply that, especially if you just take this one equation so if you apply your Kantian maxim, right, this idea of what is the best moral good? Well, if everybody was a Theravada Buddhist, we'd all be wandering around with begging bowls, but there'd be nobody to put anything in them. <laughs> so that doesn't actually work universally. It works when you have a little community surviving off of a public. But what happens when you want to transform the world? That's called Mahayana Buddhism and the Bodhisattva path. So 
that I did it again. I, I plugged the Mahayana another time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Hi, Lauren, please. Oh, Noam, can you, un or can I, can we? I did. No, there uh, you go. So it is my understanding that uh, being a Theravada monk, you you work on yourself in the hope that you become a better person to then be able to help the others. By so your statement to me, as I'm a Theravada, uh, doesn't compute as well as you make it sound because, because by working on myself and being better, being a better person, then I become a Mahayana in a, in a way, right? Does that make sense? It makes it, total sense. It makes super sense within the context of your tradition. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I don't recognize you, so we might maybe your first uh, time he here. Nice to meet you. I was uh, told by Michelle to come here that I would love it, and I love everything. So. <laughs> yeah, and, and it really is for me a... a a difference of emphasis with kind of ultimately the same potential result, if you will. So I, I agree. I hear with totally with what you're saying with the philosophy of, well, no, I, I work on myself and then that kind of a ripple effect, if you will, that kind of ripples out to the world. Absolutely. But there's this other kind of path, that Bodhisattva path, where I would suggest that the the practice is less self-focused, but only because, and and um, I often say this, by the way, in, in, in my feeling about it is the early, the Theravada path is sort of a path of discipline. Whereas the Mahayana path, I kind of consider a slightly more path of, of wisdom and what I mean by that is it's sort of about focus on body conduct and practice, and that will sort of affect the mind, clear the mind up. Whereas in the Mahayana, there's sort of deep contemplative practices about emptiness and no self that if you're wise about that, you just won't do those things naturally. <laughs> you wouldn't even think about lying to somebody. Meaning there needs to be that ego for lying to even seem beneficial. So the Mahayana is deep in this work around how do we deal with this illusory sense of agency and self? And so from a Mahayana point of view, it's like, well, what if we just don't even address the self and just focus on all sentient beings all the time. From that point of view, going into the woods alone is a little self-serving, a little. But again, I'm just pointing out a, a difference of emphasis, not ultimate goals. I would suggest the ultimate goal of both these paths is the same, so. Any other comments, questions, answers, or ideas about Jivaka? Cool. Then I think that's all we have to say about the Jivaka Sutta. Cool. So once again, I just want to emphasize um, no answers, just good questions in that way, just kind of poking around. So. Uh, you have a question. Oh, Noe? I'm sorry, did we do number 13? <laughs> oh, my gosh, I didn't finish the sutta. I'm so you glad we have 10 minutes sutta. left. Thank you, Noe. It's, I left it out there and then I didn't come back. Huh? So, the conclusion of the sutta. When this sutta was said, Jivaka Kumara Bacha said to the Blessed One, huh? It's wonderful, Venerable Sir. It's marvelous. The bhikkhus sustain themselves with permissible food. 
the bhikkhus sustain themselves with blameless food. Magnificent, venerable sir. Magnificent, venerable sir. Master Gotama has made the Dharma clear in many ways, as though turning upright what had been turned upside down, as revealing what had been hidden, as showing the way to one lost, or like holding up a lamp in a dark room for those with eyes to see. From today, let the Blessed One remember me as a lay follower who has gone forth to him for refuge, for life. And that concludes the sutra. <laughs> so again, it would seem that uh, Jivaka, who basically the way that I, the way that I read this sutra is, Jivaka was like, the Buddha's into slaughtering animals. I don't want to. I don't want to be a Buddhist. Like that sucks. And so he goes to the Buddha. Is like, is it true that you guys like are into slaughtering animals? And the Buddha's like, I've never said that. Let me explain exactly what I teach. <laughs> and then the Jivaka is like, oh, that's your position? <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> so <laughs> that's my quick paraphrase. Of, of the... <laughs> but yeah, I do. I do read it as a, a, a conversion story in that way. So. All right. Thank you, Noe, for catching me on that. Happy to finish the sutta.